We're going to jump right into it, sir. Great. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Coffee or Beer Zoom Style, the only show that asks people in the music industry, hey, what's going on, music industry? What's the <laughs> happening and what, why the music industry and stuff? Hey, thank you for uh, tuning in and, and catching another exciting episode. I am super stoked and excited to have our guest on today. Very, very lucky to have him on board. You may recognize his voice, but you're going to see him on video in a minute. Anyway, uh, Alex Baker <laughs> from Kerrang! Fresh Blood. Hello, sir. Hello, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing mighty fine. Mighty fine. Thank you very much. Uh, how Fabulous. Are you? I'm all right, man. I'm living the lockdown life, as we all are at the moment. Going on the long down, oh, lockdown. Oh, mate, there. trust me. It, this is this has been shaved as well. It was out here at one point. I was. My wife was like, "You need to lose that, dude." So I started cutting it back. I can't do it though. Like without sounding like a, a sort of knob, I've usually I've got a beard barber, <laughs> and I've not been <laughs> to see my beard barber for months. So I miss you, cat, if you're listening. <laughs> Hey, everybody, that's what you need to do. Drop what you're doing, get a job in radio so you can all afford beard barbers. <laughs> that's my only them. luxury, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you've got breakfast on the right-hand side, you've got lunch tingling around in the middle, and dinner <laughs> like nice. rotting on the far corners of the left-hand side of the big beard. It's horrific. Absolutely <laughs> uh, horrific. Speaking of, uh, of uh, food and drink, what's your drink of choice, mate? Definitely beer. Yes. Don't even hit me with that. Co- I'm not a maniac. I'm not going to have a coffee at this time of night, but I've got a brew dog here, Punk IPA. Do you know what? I never used to like beer. It's mm. grown on me over the years. Mm. I like the bitterness now. I I'm more of a rosé guy, usually. A what one? Rosé? Ro- I'm usually a rosé guy, yeah. Get out of town. This is not called rosé or coffee. It. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Corona with lime. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, cheers. Nice. Thank you for being on the show. Cheers. Kink. Can I crack it? Are we on? This oh, is yeah. great. Oh, oh yeah. listen to that. Sound of jealousy. Oh, amazing. Oh, Can you believe that um, Lord in heaven. Corona stock went down when uh, this virus thing was kicking off because people thought that Corona beer was going to give them coronavirus? Do you know what? I'd like to say no, I can't believe it. But unfortunately, with the absolute utter state of society at the moment, <laughs> people have shown their true colours. Yeah. I, I can 100% believe it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 100%. And I swear, I swear, that's not a fact. I have, I have not proved take that whatsoever. I heard it <laughs> or read it somewhere. And now I just take it as gospel truth. But it is the kind of thing <laughs> you can imagine uh, idiots doing. So anyway, um, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> go buy some things. <laughs> um, right, everybody, I'm sure you all know, but if uh, anyone out there who doesn't, uh, Alex, you are the radio presenter for the Kerrang! Fresh Blood Rock Show. Every yeah. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, 10 till uh, midnight. And I listen again on Kerrang! Radio and on demand on the Kerrang! Radio app as <laughs> well. Sorry, I can't help myself. Absolutely. But, yeah. pl- plug away, plug away. Um, I'm a huge fan <laughs> of the show myself, been listening for many years. And Thanks, um, yeah, I just wanted to say, first of all, congrats on th- how long have you been doing it for? Do you know what? I've been doing it for such a long time. Um, <laughs> 2006, I started, which, wow. which is 14 years ago, really, coming up on, um, which, is, which is amazing. Like, and I'm quite, I, there's very few things in my life that I'm proud of, <laughs> you know? Like, not, I'm not saying that like, I live this like, hedonistic lifestyle and I'm a complete maniac, but fresh blood is something that I'm really proud of. Um, it's been my baby really for such a long time mm. and we've had so many successes with the show and so many bands that have gone on to do really well and, and utilize the tool that I provide, you know, the, the platform that I provide through it to, to yeah. further themselves and, and get onto great things. So I'm really, really proud of it. And, you know, I've never missed a show either, which, which is pretty mad when you think about it. Like I've never missed a show every week for 14 years. I've done the show. Like, through thick and thin uh, when I got married on and I was on my honeymoon I did the show when when my wife was giving birth to my daughter I did the show you know like in a <laughs> hospital car park you know like no I, I don't know I've just got it into my head that I never ever want to miss the show and I never have <laughs> I love that hey that deserves a that deserves a cheers right there Whee! A, a toast to commitment well done toast to commitment mm. other God beers damn. are available 
that's, yeah. that's amazing, man. That's absolutely amazing. Congratulations. It's been a real, it's been a real fun ride doing it, you know. And and I, I always say that I'll do it until there's like no breath left in my lungs, or in, until they replace me with a younger, better model. <laughs> but, but for the time being, I'm I'm stoked. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, what, first of all, that's that's crazy. I didn't realize it was quite that long. And what what an achievement. I mean, how did you even get the job? Oh man, there's a. I'll give you. There's a long story and there's a short story. So I'll try and. I'll try and tell you the long story, but in a nutshell. Uh, so I, I, I went to uni. Um, I went to Birmingham Uni uh, to do philosophy just because I didn't really know what to do. And I thought it would be interesting. And it definitely was interesting. Um, and while I was there, Kerrang Radio opened in Birmingham. And I was just like, oh, my God. Like, what the hell? The, the magazine that I grew up listening, uh, reading, listening to, I'm so radio, I can't help myself. The magazine that I grew up reading has launched a radio station. It's here in my city. I'm not from Birmingham, but I was there for, for uni and stuff. And I just finished and I was in bands and I was doing like the whole band thing and, and trying to, you know, get on loads of tours and play loads of shows. And we were having success and doing lots of cool stuff. But when Kerrang opened, I just thought to myself, I have to be part of this. And I've always had it in the back of my head that I wanted to do a show to support new music. Like, mm. cause I've been played on radio and I know how amazing it is to get that support and how to, when you have that stamp of approval and, and that presenter talking up your band and hyping you up, like it's the most amazing feeling on earth. And I really wanted to give that back to, to artists who, who deserved it. Um, but I had no idea how to break into that industry. I didn't know anyone that worked in the media at all. Like, it's not like my dad was famous or whatever like that. Like I had no in, in that respect. Yeah. Um, so I, I just had to sort of try and forge my own my own way and I basically to cut a long story short I knocked on the door and said I don't know how we're going to sort this out um, you know I think we, we're going to have to work on this together but I have to work here <laughs> so we just need <laughs> no to figure choice. out yeah we just need to figure out how that's going to work and literally in the reception of the building like talking to the receptionist and they were like right well keep checking on our website because we put jobs up and stuff and then I did, I checked it religiously. And then two jobs came up, one for head of news. So a news broadcast, news journalist, uh, not just any old news journalist, but the head of news. And the other one was for like a street team, like Kerrang Radio street teams, you know, handing out car stickers, going and flyering gigs, all that kind of stuff, getting the Kerrang Radio brand out there. Right. Um, and I, uh, I applied for both of them, despite having absolutely no journal at that point, no journalistic experience at all, and not not really much of an interest in news. Uh, I applied for that and the street team one, and wrote a covering letter all about how I'm going to be their great head of news, and they're going to be so pleased that they hired me and all this stuff, like tongue in cheek, really taking the pit. And they rang me and they said, "Oh, we really like, we really like liked your covering letter. We thought it was really funny. Obviously, we're not going to put you forward for the head of news, but do you want to come in for a role in the street team?" And I was like, oh, my God, yeah, like 100%. So I went along to this. So I promised you I'd make this a long story short. But actually, I think it's an important story to hear it, from like an industry important. point. Please, take your time. <laughs> I'll be here all day. <laughs> my favourite topic, me. Uh, so, uh, I'm only joking. So, um, so we did. So we went, I went along to this interview, and it was like a group interview, you know, where there's like 30 different people, and it's like stages, and you have to do challenges and all this kind of stuff. It's like my idea of hell, if I'm honest, but... I so wanted to work there. And um, yeah, got I got after this whole process, I got a job as on the street team. And I was stoked, like absolutely stoked. And I think this is this is the thing that's so important to get across to anyone that's listening to this or watching this that kind of wants to get into the industry. I think it's such an important thing to recognize. What I noticed immediately from doing shifts and being in this street team, because it was a big street team, there was lots of people. Yep. There was two different types of people. There were people that really wanted to work in radio, work in the media, really passionate about it, felt like they had something they wanted to bring to it and just didn't care what it took. They just had to, they had to do it. Right. And then there were people that just really wanted to hang out with bands and right. weren't really that bothered. And the lion's share, the, the, the majority of the people in the street team who are there for, in my, in my view, the right reasons, i.e. trying to get a foot in the door, trying to make a, a name for themselves in the industry and be helpful, uh, you know, that, that was, they were in the minority. The majority was people that wanted to meet bands. And after like, maybe like a few months of doing this casual work, because it was casual, it would be like, there'd be a shift one week and then nothing the next. And maybe there'd be three shifts the week after, but then nothing after that for like a month or whatever. It was, kind of came up as and when. 
um, I said to after three months of that, I said to the guy who ran the street team, I was like, I've noticed this, what I just explained. And he laughed and was like, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it's like. And I said to him, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, but I want you to know, as you're the person that's in charge of this team, I'm coming to do these shifts because I want to work for this organization. Like, I, I want to make a difference. I want to be helpful. I want to be here. Um, and I want you to know that. And he was like, I really appreciate that. Like, no one's ever said that before. And I was like, man, what is wrong with these people? Like, this is your opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Like, why aren't you taking it? So that that turned into um, me actually ending up running that team. I, like, took the responsibility off his hands so I could, like, help out and, and sort the shifts out and all the rest of it. And from there, um, the thing that was kind of like, I guess, with hindsight, a really clever move, but at the time just seemed like the obvious thing to do, is I decided to go around to everybody in the office and try and make myself helpful. So I'd go around to every different person that was there. So whether it was the head of music, who was a lady called Emma Newman at the time, uh, the content director, uh, the breakfast show producer, head of sales, head of marketing, um, you know, um, uh, you know, all, all sorts of different facets, the technology team, news team, <laughs> everybody. And just said, look, you know, we're all stoked that we're here. We're at Kerrang Radio. Like, this is the coolest brand ever. Like, but there must be something you don't like about your job. There must be an element of your job that you don't like. What is it? Tell me what it is. Show me how to do it. And I'll do it for you so you never have to do it again. No so, way. So I, That's what you said to every single member of the team. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically what I did is I kind of, I, I learned so much about the whole business and by virtue of that the whole of radio from every aspect from you know like i say marketing to sales to programming you name it i learned about all of that because of everything i was learning off all these people and i managed to sort of create this steaming hulking pile of shit that nobody else wanted to do um but was useful stuff to do and it kind of honed my own skills and in in, in that kind of move i i learned loads and also i made myself really liked you know, in the office, because I actually made myself useful and taking tasks off people's hands that they didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And down the line, after sort of, you know, almost a year of doing that, as well as street team stuff, can't have been a year, must have been six months. But after, after or during this time, um, a new boss started and they were like, hey, you know, hey, people who work here, I need a new producer to do this, that and the other who who's key who, who's good who can you recommend and they all said oh, it's got to be Alex so I got my first gig as a producer which was amazing now one of the people that I helped during that six months period was mm -hmm. Loz so Loz Guest who was our specialist show producer at the time he was he was producing everything from like punk shows to rock shows all this sort of different stuff yeah. I was helping him out and I helped him out with the unsigned show which was a show that he used to do way 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 back in the day and um I, I was helping him out with like writing, you know, paragraphs on the bands that we should be supporting and bands that I'd met on tour and all this kind of stuff and bands that I've been playing with like early days horizon when they just had, this is what the edge of your seat's made for and all that kind of stuff, early days, architects, darkest tomb and all that kind of business. And, and I was writing all this stuff for him, all this prep. And then one day he said to me, and I owe Loz everything in where this is concerned. One day he said to me, Alex, man, you're so passionate about this. Like you're, you're so ingrained in this scene. Like, why don't you come and do the show with me? And I was like, what? Are you Actually, this is it. Air, be on the air with him as a co-host. Be on the air. And I was like, he was like, yeah, you can come on and just rather than me just saying what you're writing, why don't you come on and we'll do it together? And I was like, game changer. That's unbelievable. So I started doing that. And a few months after doing that, Loz was like, you, you are so much more passionate about this than I am. Not that he's not passionate about new music because he really is, mm. but he has got so much other stuff to do. Mm. Um, do, do you want to take this show on as you sit by yourself? And I was just like, oh my God. Like, that was like tears o'clock. You know, I was like crying my eyes out, couldn't believe it. This is a show that I'd wanted and like, everything that I'd kind of worked towards to kind of create this, you know, this sort of brand internally for myself within Kerrang and had all come to fruition. And I think that's why I've been so since then so absolutely like almost militant about that show. Like I've been so, um, like I say, treat it like a baby. Really, I don't really let anyone near it, <laughs> which is a bit mean, perhaps. As people over the years have like offered to help, and I've been like, no, no, no. It's actually only in the past couple of months that a long, long, long time listener to the show, Laura, who um, who came in and did work experience loads for us at Kerrang loads and loads she kept coming back and was again one of these people that was really helpful 
she now works within Bauer, who's the organization that own Kerrang Radio. Um, and I bumped into her in a corridor. I hadn't seen her for years. And she was like, oh my God, Alex, how are you doing? Da, 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 da. And she emailed me and she was like, don't suppose there's any chance you want some help with the show. And I actually thought, do you know what? I do. I do want your help. I don't want anyone's help, but I do want your help. So she now helps me with the show, which is amazing. <laughs> anyway, yeah. sorry, man. I've talked loads there. <laughs> Look, I want everyone to to go back and re-listen to this because there were so many um, nuggets of wisdom in, in that story that, um, that I think some people might have uh, misheard. First of all, like, like the passion that like, is, is very clear, very evident. And like the initiative, like that, there's tons of initiative in that story that you've shown there, clearly, that no one else was doing or no one else had you know, thought to do. And you got your way in. And then you did the next thing of once you actually had your foot in the door, you became problem solver. And that's like that any, anyone that like works in, you know, is an entrepreneur or has anything to do with business knows that one of the first things you do is figure out what a problem is and try to solve it for someone. So you create your own right. demand kind of thing and you make yourself invaluable to that company. It's both the things that you did and, uh, and did it with, with that much drive and passion that you weren't asking for anything in return, which just cemented this excellent reputation, which obviously saw you through to do it. And I think, first of all, like congratulations. And also people take note because that's like, if you want a job, in, in anything like that, go and make yourself um, invaluable and just and show initiative and provide whatever you can provide to people just by asking them. Like literally, as easy as that. Tell me what you don't like yeah. doing, I'll do it for you. I mean, amazing, yeah. absolutely amazing. And now you've got some help from someone that's clearly shown some some similar signs to you. Did how does it feel to actually have the help and use? Is it like oh man, like there's so much more I can do with another person here? Like yeah, mob into my Batman kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's. It's a blessing. It's a blessing having having her help. It really is. And she's so passionate about new music and cares so deeply about it. I mean, I never would have said yes if she didn't, you know, and she's such a fan of new music. Mm. Um, but I mean, I suppose there's part of me that, just, that I, I and she'll she'll laugh if, as, as I say this, but I, I feel consistent, like constantly guilty. Like every time I ask her to do something or if she's just done something I've not had to ask, I'm just like, oh, God, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, you can, you can bail out at any time if I'm asking to do much, if I'm asking too much. Just because I don't know, I just as a sister, I've, I've, I'm not a natural delegator. I don't think in that respect. So not when it comes to fresh blood anyway. I think it's too uh, it's such a I'm so close to it that it's yeah. difficult sometimes to, to let things go. But it's been a, it's been amazing. And I'm so appreciative of her help. And she's the right person to help as well. But, but you're right, you know, apart from her, I have never been asked that question. And I think that's astonishing. Like 14 mm -hmm. years of doing what I, what I do, all this, so many people I've met that want to break into the industry, want to be radio presenters, want to be producers, want to do, want to write for magazines, want to do this, want to do that. By the way, every now and then you might hear my daughter screaming in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Over all these years of doing all this stuff, nobody has ever said to me, tell me what you don't like about your job and I'll do it for you. And, and I think that's astonishing because to yeah. me, my God, who doesn't want to welcome that person into their, into their fold, you know, someone oh, yeah. who's in it for the right reasons and just wants to learn and progress and, and be, and be helpful. So yeah, yeah I don't that's know. An, that's an, where does that passion come from for you? Where does it, where does that extend from, man? Because you, you need a constant burning pile of passion in the music industry. <laughs> um to, 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 i've been doing it five minutes and i'm uh, and uh not saying i'm burnt out but i'm saying that I, I really have so much admiration um for everyone that's done it for such a long time because it can be often quite a thankless task but that aside like that's all that's all well and good but where does it come from for you because it's clearly there in abundance i think i think where fresh blood's concerned i think it's really about understanding that it's so much bigger than myself right. do you know what i mean like I've seen it firsthand again and again and again. If a band gets played on a brand like Kerrang Radio and they use that for the right, because there's two things, right? So there's exposure to an audience. So there's an audience there of people that listen who love new music. And that's what I love about the audience I've got to my show, that they're not just people that like new music. They're people that love it. They go out of their way for the bands. Like, And, and bands have told me this time and time again. Their sales were like this. They got played on the show and it went like that. And it's not because I'm not saying I've got the biggest show in the world. I haven't. You know, there's other shows that are bigger, like on Radio 1 and stuff like that, because mm. uh, of the way it's distributed, not because of the quality. <laughs> I'm joking. But, <laughs> not really. joking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's because of the passion they have. You know, they're, they're, they're listening to, let's turn the game down now, they're listening to the, uh, the, the, the show and to discover the bands that they're really going to fall in love with and follow. 
And, you know, the bands that understand that and take that and run with it, I've seen bands get signed to tour managers. I've seen bands get themselves on tours because they're able to say, we've got support of Kerrang. Hey, Kerrang Radio is supporting us. Alex is supporting us. They know that that matters and that means something. So they can use it to, to help further themselves. And before you know it, they're on festival stages. They're doing well. They're on front cover of magazine. And, and, and the rest is kind of history. So I think there's something really, it is, I've got a sort of innate understanding that this isn't just about, isn't just about me and my profile and my platform. It's about what I'm doing with it and, and elevating other people. And I think I've got myself in trouble over the years because I'm quite vocal at times about influencers and stuff like that. And I think the reason I've got nothing to, to go on the record, I've got nothing against influencers. What I've got something against is people that are in it for themselves and not for the wider industry. You know, I, I'm, you'll never see me just hanging out at a VIP area because I want to make content for my channel to further my own needs. That's not what I do. Everything I do is about creating a platform for other people to thrive. And, you know, and I think if you follow me on Twitter or whatever, you'll see that's abundantly clear pretty, pretty much straight away because basically most of the things I talk about and post are just alienate everyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I'm not making any friends online, that's for sure. <laughs> but but, but that, that's, that's, that's the value. Like people, you know, every, we're, we're drowning in information, but um, starved for wisdom. I think that's the, the quote or what have you. But basically what people want are the decision makers. They want someone with an opinion. They don't want someone that's middle of the road or not willing to say how they really feel. I'm talking about someone that's in an influential position like yourself because they want the opinion. At the end of the day, that's the reason right. I think that radio's not going anywhere. I mean, I want to get your thoughts on this, obviously, but that's yeah. the difference. Anyone can put themselves online and put themselves on Spotify and pay to get on this and pay to get on that, but you can't just get on your show. You've got to, they've got to get past you. You know, they've got to right. convince, they've got to sell themselves on you. And, um, and that's, it's a vote of confidence, isn't it? To be on the show, like if you get approved, like that's the seal of proof right. that you're decent, right? I mean- Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Do you know what? It's interesting because years and years ago, like quite a long time ago, I'll never forget it. I was at this kind of industry party. I was having a great time. Rosé in the air, chatting to people. <laughs> that rosé having... again. I love a rosé. Talking of which, let's have a little speak. But <laughs> you'll find out later there was no beer in this can. It was just straight up rosé. <laughs> but... <laughs> Emptied it, filled it up and put the seal back on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but um, I was at this party and this guy from a unnamed... Uh, major streaming brand <laughs> came up next to me and was like, oh, right, Alex, how's it going, mate? I was like, yeah, yeah, good. How are you? Like, what's your name? Like, nice to meet you. He had a chat and, you know, he seemed sort of pissed, but pleasant enough. And then he sort of said, so what's it like knowing that you work for a, an industry that's going to be dead in 10 years? And I sort of like, I thought, oh, okay, so I'll see where this is going. But I just sort of smiled and said, oh, I think you'll find actually that what, what we'll see in the future is that technology is actually going to further our capacity to reach an audience rather than diminished it. And he kind of looked really crestfallen and sort of just walked off. Suck on that, <laughs> wasn't, motherfucker. Yeah, wasn't expecting a sort of like thought through answer. He just wanted some emotion from me. Probably mm. probably follows me on Twitter. But <laughs> but um <laughs> but actually that, you know, not, again, not with not meaning to sound like a dick, but that that proved to be right. You know, technology has evolved so much and and, you know, the proliferation of like apps and smart speakers and IP listening and all that kind of stuff has only strengthened radio. Mm. You know, people don't realize that the, the majority actually just slightly of um, of listening through streaming is radio rather than streaming platforms, um, which is absolutely amazing. And, and the thing is, I've you're absolutely right about that. You know, and what you're describing is a filter. And, and I've only ever thought of myself as a filter. So you think about the internet the internet is impossible to navigate without filters filters yeah. are are absolutely at the core of the internet without them we'd be absolutely screwed google's a filter you know yeah. playlists are a filter um every single thing that you come across is a filter they even use the words don't they when you're clothes shopping or whatever you filter out the stuff because otherwise it's impossible to navigate yeah and my job my sort of reason to be within new music is to be that filter and and i personally don't think as sophisticated as algorithms get, and this might make me sound like an old man, but I really genuinely don't think that an algorithm can have the, the sort of sophisticated human heart that a person creating music can. Now, yeah. of course, with a playlist, there are people behind those, play some of them, not all of them, some of them are algorithmically created, but some, a lot of them are 
are are people powered and there's people at spotify and apple music and the like who do amazing work compiling those 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 um playlists and you know what as streaming streaming has got more and more powerful more and more and has reached mass or ever increasing mass being on one of those playlists is absolutely incredible for bands so because of that i'll never say anything against playlisting i think it's Mm. an amazing thing yeah. Bands getting on those huge playlists with millions of followers is an amazing thing and can completely change how they're perceived online and their earning potential as well, which is also super important. But does it diminish my role as a filter who has a personality who's able to excite people about music? Absolutely not. Mm. And that's what you don't get in the in the streaming world is you don't get someone going, OK, here's a song that I'm about to play you. And the reason I'm going to play you this song is this. The, the reason I think this artist matters is this. Mm-hmm. Listen out for the middle eight. It's so incredible for this reason. The way the music juxtaposes with the lyrical content is sensational for this reason. And, and all that additional context and flavor can be the difference between someone hearing a song and going, yes, all right. And, and someone hearing a song and going, that they are my new favorite band. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah and, yeah, and and for me, without that context, and and I'm not bagging on other presenters, right? But there are presenters who who play new music who will just play new music. Mm. They'll go right. Here's a new one from so and so. Play, and it comes on. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, mm. you're giving them a platform. You're getting the name out. Great. But for me, giving that additional context and that initial that additional heart, and also giving bands things they can put in press releases and quote, and and if, that's so important. And um, yeah. So I'm just a big fat filter. <laughs> you have the years of experience now too. That's another reason why your opinion counts so much is you've listened to God knows how many hours and days and weeks and months worth of music now. So you yeah. really, you know, you know, uh, you know what's good and what's not. And, uh, and that's, and that's really the value, but like what, so what are some of those things that do make bands good in your opinion? What are the yeah. you look out for when you're listening to all, to all that music? What are you think you're listening for? It's a great, it's a really great question and a question that's so hard to answer. I think there's, there's, because there's what I also try and do when I'm listening to music is I try and put my personal preferences aside because my show, although obviously I support and really care and really like all the music I play, Mm. some of it is much more a personal preference than others, right? There's some bands that I wouldn't necessarily listen to every day of the week, but I can appreciate that they're really good and there's an audience of people that will love them. You know what I mean? So it's not just, it's not just, what what I think it's about kind of a more of a subjective approach or objective approach I suppose to to what makes music good so I think there's there's loads of things that I've realized over the years in terms of what I value in music in terms of musical craft one of the things I actually talking about on the show just last week was the 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 way that it's it elevates songwriting is elevated for me if the music is in some way properly connected to the lyrical content you know and that can go in both ways like motown days and the old soul soul days there was always this wonderful juxtaposition between really like catchy upbeat spirited top lines and horrifically gut-wrenchingly depressing lyrics you know (laughs) which which is such a fantastic juxtaposition because you find yourself singing along people say i'm the life of the party you know tracks to my tears so you actually really realize what that song's about it's so sad a man looking himself in the mirror wondering if it's possible to cry so much that you can see the tracks of your tears in his face you know like oh. <laughs> Smokey robinson and the miracles so there's always that juxtaposition and that's why i've always i was always drawn to bands like poison the well and um and funeral for a friend because again they had this really uh, well put in poison the well sense they had this really aggressive horrifically aggressive music like proper post-hardcore and then they had the lyrical content which was so delicate and beautiful and poetic and all about love and life and carry me away and all this kind of stuff and then um and then similarly you know, uh, oh, who was the other band I just said? Poison the Whale and... Funeral for a Friend. Yeah, funeral, for, funeral for a Friend, exactly the same. You find yourself, like, walking along, like, going, yeah, Roses for the Dead, what an amazing song, Streetcar, brilliant. You actually sit back and analyse it, and you think, why do I feel so sad? It's because all the lyrics are so depressing. Yeah. So there's, there's, that, there's something really nice about that juxtaposition, but equally, you know, there's something really nice about when the music really complements the lyrics. And you know, there's a band I'm playing at the moment who are, are actually annoyingly can't remember the name <laughs> can't remember the name of them Always i remember annoying. talking about them but i can't remember which band it was but they but they're right oh they're called mint they're called mint uh, from Grims- grimsby they, they've got a, a real knack of writing music that's they've written this song which is about the feeling of having a panic attack 
and the song itself feels like a panic attack you know and and, and having that kind of instinctive uh, thought process of, of making sure the music properly reflects the lyrics is is a craft that not everybody can do some people just write a song and then write some lyrics and stick them together without worrying about you know the, the wider context or the cracks and I, I i think the magic happens in the cracks and then in that kind of exciting um, either a, juxt a purposeful juxtaposition or or, or or something really intentional not everyone does that so that's one thing i always look out for i always look out for drama as well drama in music just for me elevates music to a whole nother level um there's so much drama frothy. within the actual song or drama within the band like the, a story you know drama within the song although often drama within the song comes from drama within the band of course, yeah, 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 of course <laughs> anyone yeah. that's listened to like Fleetwood Mac's rumors knows how dramatic things can get when your bands are where everyone fucking hates each other how they're still <laughs> uh, able to go on tour sometimes it's like <laughs> what Singing the songs up with each other and like, someone else is like, crazy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll probably like it in the in the post COVID COVID world. They probably like it because they won't be able to see each other or be near each other. They'll be all isolated from each other all the time, and they'll probably yeah. be alright with that. But yeah, I just think yeah, um, yeah, drama like drama in in the music and and uh, you know that that's just such an important thing. And again, there's there's a lot of bands that kind of go, let's just be fast or let's just let's just be catchy, but they're not thinking about those added depths and 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 that really matters and, and for someone like myself who spends such a lot of time listening to music you can hear it immediately mm. if a band hasn't got the drama it's gone like I, I, there's hundreds of other bands that do you know what i mean mm. so for me that's like a really important thing but you know the, the final thing i suppose well not final thing because there's a million things we could talk about where that's concerned but one of the things i think is really important and it's kind of been bastardized over the years is for obvious reasons is the x factor you know a lot a lot of people forget they just think of the x factor as being a show like fronted up by simon cowell but the x factor is an actual thing like mm -hmm. it is an actual thing you know and, and for me and i've said this on air before when i when i come across an artist who who has it it like it just shimmers off them i can see it whether they're on stage in front of me or whether i'm listening to it in my ears immediately I get this sense that there's something so much more interesting going on here. There's something so special about what I'm privileged enough to be witness to mm. often, especially when it's in the early stages as well. Like I'll never forget driving up the M40 um, and I had a box of CDs next to me in the car. And what I do is I'd eyes on the road, obviously I'd be in the car <laughs> And um, I used to drive up and down the M40 all the time because I used to live long distance from my, my now wife. It worked out, thankfully. Almost didn't. <laughs> but I used to drive up and down the M40 all the time. She was down here and I was in Birmingham and because um, Kerrang was there. And yeah, I'd, I'd pick out a, a CD. These are all submissions to, to the On Sign Show, which is now known as Fresh Blood. Um, all these submissions in this box, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of CDs. And I'd have tens and like hundreds of these boxes. They're just everywhere. And I'd get one out, eyes on the road. I wouldn't even look at it. I'd just put it in and it would start playing. I'd listen to it. If it was good, I'd throw it in the back of the car. If it wasn't good, it would go in the footwell. And at the end of the I'll journey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just littering up the M4, <laughs> shamelessly littering. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. But, but if, at the end of the journey, I'd, uh, I'd look at the footwell and like get everything out bag it up and take it to recycling center we'll just chuck it in the bin it was a while ago um but then the ones at the back i'd re-listen to and i'd go through them again and go right there was something in that that i loved it needs my it, does, it demands my attention again and i'd listen again and then that would get whittled down again and then stuff would get on the show and that was kind of part of the process that didn't just happen in the car it happened at home and it, on you know listening through to links and everything else but that was like the physical process with physical submissions and i never forget like on the m40 I, start, I say exactly that process, stuck one in, eyes on the road. And it was the first few bars of Floors by Bastille. And this was before Bastille was anything, right? right. This was just a guy making, making music in his bedroom on his laptop by himself. And actually, ended it, the, the CDR was like just written on in like biro or whatever. It wasn't even like a printed up thing. And, and I'll never forget it. I was just like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, I was just like straight. And it's, just, this is, it's the same feeling every time I come across like an artist like this. I was just like, this guy has got it. And I played it again. And I was like, 
this song is amazing. His voice, the lyrics, the song, everything about it is just amazing. And I was absolutely buzzing to play him. Buzzing. And I think I played him like two or three times on the trot the first time I played it. And he was on the show every week for months. And then I got a phone call from, from Virgin saying that they'd signed him. And they were like, oh, you know, heard him on the show. Like, absolutely amazing. Like, you know, um, and I presume they were already across it anyway. And it was just like they were being nice because, you know, they, they A&R departments do know what they're doing. <laughs> they don't just all listen to the show and only sign things they hear on the show. But they were like, yeah, we, we, we really appreciate the support. And he's he's he, they used a phrase, I forget, but they're like about him being like a lifer. They can see that he's going to go the whole way. And I was like, totally, totally right. And it was the same with, you know, it was the same with Shikari. The first time I played Shikari on air, they didn't have anything out. Uh, I had to I had to stream uh, OK time for Plan B off their MySpace page. Wow! Because because they didn't have I didn't have any music. I didn't have an MP3. I didn't, they didn't have a, si- a single out. Were you one of the first people to play them? Yeah, as far as I know, yeah, yeah, really properly wow. early days, and like just streamed it off the MySpace, and it sounded all squelchy and shit. But I didn't care because I just wanted to get it out there. Same sort of story. Bring me, bring me. Were just getting there before I started the show, though, so they were kind of already on the way. But um, but certainly gave him a lot of support. Same with architects. And then there was this. There's a girl. She'd indulge me, so I'm talking a lot. There's a girl, I'll, and I've told this story on air. Um, who I went to judge a kind of unsigned competition, you know, singing competition type thing. And this girl got up in stage in Hayes, I think I was, it, like this hall in Hayes. And this girl got up on stage and she sang and she was absolutely amazing. And it was exactly that same thing. It shimmered off the stage. I, I felt excited and I, I was just like, oh, my God, she's got it. She's got it. And she sang this original song and she was so talented. And at the end of the uh, the show, like there was all these artists that performed across the course of the day. At the end of the show, um, she didn't win. She didn't get, she didn't even get through. And I was like, I was livid. I was like, I turned, I turned to the other judges. There's like 10 people on this judging panel. And I was like, how did she not get through? She was amazing. And they're like, oh yeah, I know you really liked her, but I didn't really see what the fuss was about. And I was like, what? And I was so angry. And like so many, there was a couple that agreed with me, but so many of them just didn't, just didn't agree. And I was livid. And I was like, this is ridiculous. So I went over and I saw her in the, in the lobby and she was a bit upset. And she was, with her she was only a kid. She was about 15, mm. you know, like she was upset and talking to her family. And I went over there and I was absolutely screwing. I was like, this is absolute bullshit. Like you should have flown through. You're the most talented person here. You've got the X Factor, all, all this sort of stuff. And she probably just thought I was mad. But, um, but anyway, she she ended up going to Brit school. Um, she had, she became a songwriter. She I think she's got like platinum discs. She's like written for Jonas Blue and all sorts of people. Yeah. And just in the past year, in the part well, certainly in the past sort of yeah ten months or so, she put out her debut EP, which is called Imposter Syndrome. Uh, she's uh, she's called Gracie and she's been signed up to um, uh, to Polydor and you know that Polydor are now starting to really throw their weight at her and she I'm tell you she if the world if there's any justice in the world she is going to fly because really? she's so talented and she's it's basically like kind of alternative pop you know it's like the darker side of pop like Billie Eilish kind of stuff yeah that sort of vibe but not quite not quite the same you're you're here when you when you when you listen to it but made a note of that, the Gracie. reason I tell the story Gracie yeah. But with an EY, so Gracie with an EY. The reason I tell that story is just because that, for me, that sort of talent just, it just shivers and shines. And it's the same with Dan Lancaster as well, who we, we were talking about before we, we, we pushed sort of go on this. Um, again, like he was in Proceed, incredible talent as a producer, an incredible talent. And, and everything he's done is just, it, you know, the man's a genius. And that, yeah. that's the real pleasure for me is, is being able to help people that really, really deserve it, you know? You know, for a, for a split second there, I thought you were going to say uh, it was Adele. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it turned out that she was Adele. <laughs> but then I was like, no, actually, Adele doesn't come from Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that um, would have been good. That would have been, <laughs> that been fuck, good. That's, that's a story and a half, man. I mean, yeah. Unfortunately... I mean, Unfortunately, Adele did not submit her music to Kerrang Radio, which she had. <laughs> she made a big mistake there. Be sure to yeah, tell her that. More fool you, Adele. Yeah, more fool Think you. Think on. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm incredible. Arsene, you mentioned it. I mean, who would you, did you really, like, could you really tell that people like Bring Me and Architects were going to reach the levels that they've reached now back then? 
and Shikari. Uh, it's easy for me. It's easy for me to say yes. You know, like I think I think that obviously not every band makes it. Not every band that you have that sense of belief in goes the whole hog because there are so many reasons why bands break up. You know, and I and and you know bands like Berry Tomorrow, for example, they've just trooped on. You know, they like lineup changes, all the rest of it. They have trooped on and on and on, and they've established themselves as a leading light of UK metalcore, and that's Europe metalcore. And that's not that's not because they're not brilliant. They are brilliant, but it's also because they've just kept on going. You know, they've 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 earned they've earned their place in in the scene as well as being an absolutely amazing band of course um but yeah there are bands that you think are going to go the whole way and don't and there's been tragedies and people and all, and all sorts of reasons why bands split up but but bring me with bring me for me it was like i'll just never forget the feeling it, i've always had this kind of magnetic attraction to ollie mm. i think he's I, I think he's so underappreciated in terms of his lyrical ability and his kind of vision you know, people forget that, and I've said this to them, like when I've interviewed them and chatted to them, you know, whatever. People forget that Bring Me the Horizon made, I mean, I'm not saying this to be disparaging, like it sounds like I'm taking a piss, but I'm actually not. They made kids who were listening to Britney Spears like the most angular, disgusting, heavy music on earth, <laughs> you know, yeah. like most discordant. Some of it made no sense. It was proper like diamond in the rough stuff. You know, that early EP that uh, this is what you see is made for. They created a whole scene in the UK and there was already a scene happening in the States, but they, they brought it to the UK yeah. and he started drop dead and he and poured his, all his vision and creativity into that. And, and for me, it was obvious they were going to go the whole way because they, they were, this amazing band who were so fearless and such trailblazers, but most importantly, they were led by this guy who had this, this complete vision for what he wanted to achieve backed up by talent. People forget Lee Malia is an incredibly talented guitarist. Yeah, like he's yeah, classically yeah. trained. He is the real deal, you know, and mm. experimental and stuff like that. And he's a massive driving force. And then of course I became obsessed with a band called worship. Uh, I started playing worship on the show. I fell in love with worship. I could not, could not do enough to get the name of worship out there um but they broke up and i think you know, they say they were kind of on their way out anyway but the reality is is that jordan fish joined bring me the horizon because ollie poached him <laughs> you know right and, so he was in worship yeah jordan fish was in worship he was the electronic producer and behind the backbone of the band and then he then brought and i, I remember being at a party I, remember, I was at a front party like years and years and years ago and um, I was just having a drink, having a laugh. Uh, and I saw Ollie from across the room. And it was one of those moments where you see each other. And you're like, Wee! so he went over and chatted to each other. And the first thing he said to me was worship, man. And I was like, don't, don't even get me started. And we started chatting about worship. And at that point, he didn't tell me. He said something. He said something like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got my eye on them. I've got my eye on them. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. And I was like, I remember I said something to him like, you're not going to break him up, are you, Ollie? He was like, ah, no, no, no. And that was it. And then like, however God. many months later, Jordan Fish is in, Jordan Fish is in, uh, in Bring Me The Horizon. And I was like gutted, but also super stoked for the next iteration of what Bring Me would become. And, and look what's happened. Do you know what I mean? I mean, that's it. Credit where it's due. They deserve all the success that's come to them. Because they, how do you feel about that radical change? I feel like it was, I feel like it was a real, certainly the last album compared to where they, where they started, that's a radical shift. I get there, there was a transition in the middle there, but how do you, still, it's still a big change, isn't it? To kind of go yeah, from it, one it, thing into another. It is a big change. And I, and I, and I think it's interesting that Ollie reflects it so, so personally and so uh, like, you know, unashamedly and kind of up front in his lyrics, you know, you know, that this ain't metal and all that kind of, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, I don't think he needs to, because I think one of the things that's amazing about Bring Me is that they've never, they've never ever claimed to be anything other than doing what they're doing at the time. And I think their sound has really evolved. You know, there was a, there was a fairly big jump between, um, you know, Suicide Season and and this is and uh, oh, what was the one that came after that? Um, oh, if there's a hell. If there's, yeah, a, there's a hell, yeah, there's a hell, yeah. believe you've seen it. Like there was there was a, a pretty big jump there, and then obviously an even bigger jump into Sempaternal. But um, uh, what's it called? Oh, wow, I can't I feel like my brain's not working. It's the beer. Yeah. <laughs> Too much of my mind. Yeah, but I feel like yeah. yeah, I think I feel like every every step of the way, it's been it's been a progression, and they've always 
and it comes back to Ollie's vision, and which has also been backed up by Lee's ability and, and vision, and also Jordan Fish's kind of uh, sort of role in the band. This isn't to this isn't to sort of take away anything from the other guys in the band. Of course, they are a collective. Mm. Um, but I think that I think because Ollie's always had such a strong vision and always had this like passion to do something that that that's authentic to him. Um, it, it didn't surprise me really that, that they changed and they evolved their sound because he's grown up, you know, let's, let's face it. They were kids. This is one of the things I find really interesting now is that, you know, all these bands, you know, that we used to play with and while supporting, supporting early days of their career, they were kids and now they're adults. They've got kids and stuff and like mortgages and <laughs> yeah. everything else, which is, uh, you know, obviously your sound's going to change and progress. You'd hope it would, you know, yeah, and I think but I think bands like Bring Me are important because I think they they're one of those bands that like Linkin Park and and bands like that from over the years. They're bands that have have drawn people to our world, and I think that's amazing. You know, I think we need more bands that kind of open the floodgates for people mm. to come to alternative culture and come to our sort of wonderful family that we've created together over the years. And one artist that is doing that at the moment, which I'm so excited about, is Kid Bookie kid bookie man just needs to get he's another one that just shimmers he's so talented it actually kind of like breaks my brain and what i love about kid bookie he's like one of the most incredibly talented like mcs like he could just flow for days and like with such interesting like thought-provoking lyrics but he's his heart he's a he's a punk you know he, he grew up playing guitar he was like you know told he wasn't you know doing the right thing at school because he by his friends because he liked slipknot when they didn't and and he's he's part of that kind of really exciting set of people that are just going to bring communities of people to to alternative music and 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 it, you know his talent speaks volumes and people have already started to team up with him and he's done a show he's done a, a song with Corey taylor uh, he's got some other massive collaborations coming out with other people from the rock world because people gravitate to him because he's such a talent, you know, and he really believes in it. It comes from such an authentic place. Uh, and I think, yeah. So I don't so really know a, if that's He's a rapper and he's just doing it on, on, he's featuring on rock songs, basically? No, no, no. He he creates music himself and it's it's most of it's guitar based. So it's like heavy riffs, but over beats, which he raps over. And it's like really gnarly and aggressive. Like it's honestly, it's amazing. You've got to check it out. Kid Bookie oh. for the win. I was but yeah, like, yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, one of the questions I had for you was, like, who are you listening to right now that's uh, really caught your attention? But you've already dropped some serious, <laughs> some serious uh, cool ones here Kid Bookie and, and Gracie. I think, fuck, I'm excited to hear those. Only, yeah, well, you, you, won't, you won't be disappointed, honestly. I'm just like having a look at, I, you know, I've got such a terrible memory these days. I'm just having a look up at, like, my, one of my latest playlists. So I've got fe Featured Artist of the Week last week. is Post Romantics. Fox Jaw, obviously. Everyone loves Fox Jaw. Yeah, there's, a, there's an artist called uh, Ola Bliss as well. O-L-A-H Bliss, who's just so, again, so talented. She's worked with Kid Bookie in the past. Uh, Meet Me at the Altar, the, the, a new band from the States. Sort of a bit like knuckle puck meets dance gavin dance with a bit of tiny moving parts in there just an incredible sound you know and there's just so there's so many and and I, i'm really kind of quite particular about who who i support on the show i think that yeah. they've got to be really the best of the best to get on the show you know i don't do any backhands i don't do any favors it's, it's never like that you know well for a start it's illegal to take money to play highs but <laughs> yes but, you know remember that but yeah, I mean, there's there's been difficult times in the past where I've had to say to people, you know, who I've established relationships with over the years, like, I really like you and, and I and I want to support you, but this song isn't good enough. I'm not going to play it, mm. you know. And and that's the way that's the way it goes. Like I ha that's what I mean about it. But I'm, I'm being my baby. It, it, the quality is is the most important thing, um, without a doubt. Yeah. So yeah. So it, I don't know. In a kind of long winded answer to your question. Um, I think that I do know that bands are going to make it. I do. I can, I can tell um, whether or not they actually do it is down to them and what happens in their lives rather than their ability. You know, yeah. I've never been surprised. I've never been like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Like, if, it's like Shikari, man. Like Shikari played on the Avalon stage, headlined it, download last year. I cried my eyes out watching them walk out. And and like I was just watching the side because you know I was hosting the stage because it was fresh blood state like Avalanche. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I remember it. It was a great set. I was just like I was just like 
oh, I was just, I couldn't, I was just like, I'm so proud of what they've achieved and what a voice they've got and how important they are, not just in music, but in terms of like society and, and Rue's contrib- contribution to like, culture and, and helping educate people and find a better way I, I just think they're one of the most important bands on earth and people need to really respect that and and they do thankfully you know yeah. i'm preaching to converted really i imagine <laughs> they, you're massively yeah they've got a huge diehard fan base and um for for the right reasons as well they just they are bloody great and they just keep continuing trying to push themselves or yeah. try new things out you always got to respect that um Amazing, man. Thank you. We've touched on some, so many great things here. And um, I think the, you know, I just want to wrap it up really by just asking you, like, how do you really, how are you feeling about the industry at, at this point in time? And what do you, what do you perceive as being some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities going forward? Music industry as a whole. Yeah. But and maybe yeah. just a little bit more about your own, your own role. Yeah. So I think, I think radio, radio in, in particular is, is a hard beast to crack. Because radio has has, and, and I'm not bagging on radio. It's the, I think it genuinely believe it's the best medium on earth, and I'm not just saying that because I work within it. I really believe it is, and I've done TV and podcasting, and everything else. For me, radio is it's just the one that connection you have with the audience is like nothing else, genuinely. Um, and it also doesn't rely on the visuals. It allows the brain to do the work and fill in the gaps, which I think is makes it all the more powerful. It's a bit more like reading in that sense. Mm. Um, but you know, it's shrunk. You know, the opportunities for people have, have, have diminished over the years because of like the networking of stations and and how, how things have gone. So getting your foot in the door is, is a lot harder than it was. And I think that's a challenge, I think, for people that want to get into it. I often say this to people when I when I meet them and they ask my advice. I always think there's very, very few people these days who are just presenters. You know, mm-hmm. it's very hard to make a career and a livelihood out of just being a presenter unless you're going to give it your at unless that's all you're going to do and you've got the talent and the skill and you're fortunate and you you know you make the right connections and you work it work it work it work it work it and build your way in it's really really hard to be just a presenter because there's only so many presenting jobs that command salaries that are big enough to be able to support a, a, a meaningful lifestyle right. um you know so i think that's a challenge it doesn't mean that there aren't loads of great presenting opportunities out there if you're willing to really work for them but no one's handing them out on a plate you know it, it's hard and I think a lot of people go into it quite doughy eyed with the, the sort of so many I could tell you so many examples of people that have come up to me and said oh, I want to work in radio what do you want to do I want to be a presenter like, okay so what what are you going to bring to the party well I'm just going to like come and present shows oh yeah well not really like oh you know can you can you edit like can you self-produce like what do you know about this so how are you going to add value to that you know like this there's so many strings to the bow yeah. um especially now that there's so much involved with like you know being active on social and being able to turn the camera on yourself as well as you know talk behind the mic and and all that sort of stuff and also there's a talent in it you know being able to talk on a mic you know without trying to blow smoke up my own ass it there's a there's a talent to that not everybody oh, yeah. can do it thinking on your feet i think yeah i think a lot of people think you can i think a lot of people think you can just oh yeah just play some records and chat it's, it's not as simple as that you know and mm-hmm. We found that in radio over the years that you know a lot of celebrities get hired because they've got big profile, big following, and you put them behind a mic and they don't know what to do. You know, they, they don't want to have anything to say or they don't feel like they can say it. And thankfully, that's not the case for the bands, the, the brands that I work with. We've, we've got incredible um, radio presenters who are also very talented uh, people outside of radio. But there are there are many occasions where that hasn't quite gone. <laughs> gone to plan so um so i think it's hard i think the opportunities are fewer than 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 it used to be industry as a whole i think it does it does bother me that so much of the power is being you know channeled into a few kind of key places i think bands really now have a choice to be completely part of the machine or not um, I, I do wish it was still the case that bands could sell their own music and make a really decent living from it, but it's not. You know, you have to be on the road all the time. Um, I think streaming, as we know, is a joke in terms of payments. Unless you're top flight, that top 1%, 5%, where you can earn a little bit of money from it, the money's just not there. Um, so I think that's a real challenge that hasn't really properly been addressed and, and, and probably won't be for for quite some time. Um so yeah, so that that sort of bothers me. I, I wish that there was more power back with the artists, and I wish that record labels weren't so keen on making an immediate success of an artist. And if it, you know, the development of artists isn't quite where it was 
You know, that's not the case across the board, but there are some labels who will sign an artist, put a record out, it flops, the artist's in debt, they get dropped, it's a complete disaster, and everyone's back to square one, wondering why they're bothered. So I do think we, and I say this on air quite a lot, I think we as fans of music and new music have a real role in supporting the bottom end. I think if we don't support those new artists and really give them a voice and, and, and a platform and champion them, then what's going to happen is the bottom is going to fall out of the industry. You know, there's less venues, there's less small venues to play in. You know, venues are closing down left, right, and center. They were anyway, let alone mm. before everything happened, happened. Yeah. So unless we're there actively supporting these artists and raising them up to give them the profile and gravitas and get their voices heard, um, I'm, I'm really concerned that the bottom will just fall away and then we'll just be left with stuff that we're being spoon-fed from the majors. That sounds like I'm dissing the majors. I'm not. They do amazing work and there's loads of artists they support that are, that are fantastic. But I do think we have a we have a role. You know, I think in society these days, we spend so much time blaming everybody else. But I think we have a role to make sure that we're actively, genuinely supporting new talent in any ways that we can. You know, even to the point now where I, 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 tr I try to say no when bands offer me T-shirt. Oh, let me send you a T-shirt. I'm always like, no, man, like sell that T-shirt to someone. Mm. You know, I can I'll buy one off you. <laughs> but no one can see me on the radio, dude. So it's completely wasted. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I should have worn <laughs> one today. Damn. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I just think I think we 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 it's up to us to support them. Basically, is what I'm saying. Does yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent, hundred percent. It's um, hundred percent true. I agree entirely. And you know, there's often just too many to want to support, and you know, one yeah. can't actually get out and see everything and buy all the merch at one time and I get all that but yeah it's got to make us it's got to make a start at some point like you say if it's and hopefully that will continue because even if it's okay so less venues but the ones that are still standing as long as people turn up to those venues exactly the regular, they'll stay open yeah as long as fans continue to push themselves and put out some good music if people like it they will listen to it they will download yeah. it and they will stream and that will not stop because they enjoy it as long as there's yeah enjoyment from it that it won't go away and that's about it <laughs> but people should buy the merch <laughs> if they can yeah, afford yeah. to <laughs> you know that's they, it i mean that's should. all we can hope for really that's all we yeah. can hope for and, and and what we can do um to make sure that it sort of doesn't die on its ass which i don't think it will i think music is is an absolute gift and most people kind of are aware of that mm. and most people will fight for it to, to to stay alive um but for me I, i've always said this i think new music is the most exciting and new artists are the most exciting because you know, when you come across an artist who's just breaking through or just starting out or just committed their first tunes to record, these are tunes they've been writing in their head since they were born. You mm. know, it's the product of every every influence. It's the product of every conversation and their worldview, all sort of channeled into this one place. It's not yeah. like the awkward second album they've got to rush out because a major label is expecting it within 18 months. Yeah. It's, it's something they've crafted that's really deeply personal to them for years and years and years. And I think that's where real like magic happens, you know. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you're always going to regret not putting anything out if you're, you know, on your deathbed. You're, you're never going to regret. Oh, I'm, I really wish I'd never put out music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, exactly. Like, so yeah, suffer it. I mean, thank you, thank you for all of those excellent points, and uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed <laughs> the show as much as I have because it's been great to have you on. Thank you very. Sorry, much. I've not asked you anything. <laughs> hey, um, I got nothing to say, man. Like, this, this is the. No, don't be tough. This is um, therefore nothing to say. This is as good as what you've got to say, that's for sure. So I no, don't I'm, believe that for a minute. <laughs> I, uh, I'm just really lucky to be doing the show, to be honest, and having guests like yourself on, and I've spoken to some great people over the... You yeah. have. It's a great show. It's a great show. It's a great format, you know. I think like that kind of longer-form format is where you get to really the heart of things rather than just like throwaway interviews. So I've really enjoyed watching what you do, and you're a good interviewer, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're always trying to uh, improve. Um, oh, actually, one last thing I did want to touch on, because I wanted to get your take on this. Um, you know that Spotify bought Joe Rogan? Yeah. How was, what's your feeling on that? Because I was listening to someone say that they were like, well, well if Spotify can just drop 100 mil, yeah, it was 100 mil, just 150 mil on Joe Rogan, buy him outright exclusive. It's like, does that mean that they just have like, oodles of money on hand that they could have been giving larger shares to the artists with? Is that how it, <laughs> is that how it works or what? I don't know. To be honest, I, I, I don't know. I think the, I, I haven't got anything against Spotify. I'm a Spotify user. Yeah. And I, I listen, I listen 
apart from radio and podcasts, a lot of which I listen through Spotify, that is how I consume music, Spotify. Um, I do think they've got a lot to answer for, though, if I'm honest. I think the model, I think the model does not respect the thing that makes their platform successful, mm. i.e. the artists. What are they without artists? Nothing. So how are they not properly rewarding those artists with the capital that they deserve? Um, I'm sure there's a reason why that is beyond me. I'm not I'm not involved in the business of music streaming and how their kind of P&Ls work. But for me, I just think there's something there's something broken in the machine. And I also think it's a shame that you're kind of drawn into that world. You can't you can't not be on Spotify. Right. Right. So and then as soon as you're in there, then you're part of that kind of, oh, I want to get more streams. I want to get on a playlist. And, and you've dedicated so much time to this machine that isn't really giving you enough back which feels a bit to me, if I'm honest, like an abusive relationship. So, yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah. so, I, yeah. so I, I, I'm not like, I don't, I think there's work to be done there. Um, but I can't really remember what your question was. No, it was just, well, no, it was just a, a kind of open question about, you know, how do you feel about that deal happening? Like what's, but I think. Oh, you know, about with Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know that Spotify have got a real intention to increase the, the amount of people that that utilize it for podcasting because podcasting it's, is a growing category that's already so, the biggest category on spotify um apparently is that the, right the majority of people on spotify actually use it for podcasts over music which is that's interesting it's, it's pretty it? nuts it's pretty nuts mad but, um, but yeah, yeah but i mean fair, i mean fair, fair like fair play if that it's one of the biggest podcasts in the world mm. um, and if they want to dominate in that space then then more power to them um i just hope that the benefits that they reap from it the subscribers that go up the amount of memberships that that they achieve from that move i hope that it in some way eventually filters back down to the people that make their platform what it is mm. is that I controversial agree. i don't know but i think that's fair enough don't you I, yeah yeah it has to be yeah i agree with you totally i've done videos on this as well where i've gone i don't know i get how important spotify is i get it's a big part of the pie but i don't see why it's heralded as such like the the be all and end all for bands like we want our Spotify numbers up all the time it's like why because even if you had a, a bajillion bajillion you're still not going to make a bajillion bajillion money oh, no. I know really. yeah it's like and it's mad you, isn't it you want it to sustain right the whole point should be that the band should become at least sustainable because it, the expenses are covered you're not going to get that to new Spotify stream so why is it kind of why is that the thing? But I get it I, not to discount it but yeah anyway that's maybe a, maybe a talk for another another episode yeah part two coming part soon two. <laughs> love to have you back on. i'm gonna have lots of guests back on the show like six months to a year's time because you know things yeah, change great, so quickly mate. and it'd be yeah, great to have you back on i'd love to mate it's been a pleasure it absolutely has and uh keep up the amazing work everyone go and listen to the show as always show alex all your support um and catch you on the next episode everybody thanks for <laughs> being care. on the show